Station. I can't get no call to action, but I try and I try and I try and I try. Hello and welcome to Call to Action, the go-to podcast for anyone trying to make sense of the world of marketing, advertising and beyond. In an industry that is a minefield of utter bollocks, we aim to capture our heroes and allies from the front line to have a chinwag with. It's like Pokemon Go, with the single but vital exception that it's not a short-term bandwagon of shite. It's brought to you by Gasp, and I'm Giles Edwards, co-founder and MD. Today, I've caught George Tannenbaum. One of the most highly awarded, revered and talented copywriters, creative director and third baseman on the planet, George is a freelancer who was previously ECD and copy chief at Ogilvy for over 10 years. A proper grown-up who now takes the fight to ageism in the industry, George has worked with huge brands like IBM, HP, American Express, General Motors, General Foods, and generally anyone who's anyone, and writes a hugely influential marketing blog, Ad Aged. He also has a charming French alter ego, a agency holding company CEO, who holds up a satirical mirror to the holding company era. George says, Today, despite all the concocted and virulent bullshit about diversity, As a society, we do not like people who are not like us. If they could toss people aged 50 plus out, most agencies would happily build that wall. Welcome to the show, George. But firstly, welcome to the show, the agency holding company's CEO, who has his top tips on running a successful network agency in 2020. Hello again, Giles. It is I, the agency holding company CEO, And I am so happy to be here, especially since in your wonderful introduction, you have used one of my favorite words, a word I have used as a uh, a shibboleth to my entire career. I have used as a signpost, a guidepost, a beacon to guide me through my path to success, to the 1% of the 1%, to making money like no one else makes money. And that word, my friend, is bollocks. (laughs) Bollocks in today's world, bollocks matters. It is all about bollocks. The more bollocks you are, the more quality you are. The more bullshit, the more honest. The more big, the more small. The more in, the more out. The more up, the more down. That is bollocks, my friends. And that is what matters. You attract customers by keeping them away. You get clients by treating them badly. That is the bollocks way. And that is what we at the holding company hold. That's why they call us a holding company. That is what we do. We are bollocks. (laughs) You understand? Bollocks, yes? May we. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Listen, listen, listen. I am done with the provinces now. I have to go back to the the mother country. I am back in my, I'm taking my private yacht to my private helicopter. I'm going back to Paris. I leave you all in the provinces. Goodbye, London. You have bad food, but uh, beautiful people. Thank you. This is the Holy (laughs) Company CEO saying farewell. Au revoir. Goodbye. Charles Lindbergh. Goodbye. (laughs) Salut. Oh, so that must just be only you left, George. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I never know when he's going to show up. Um, but he, he's a lovely guy. Uh, I love him. Good. Oh, misunderstood. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> right, let's get into it. Quick fire questions. We've got seven, George. We've got sure. tea or coffee? Oh, oh, coffee, by far. Apple or IBM? Um, that's kind of a, a story. You know, like most creatives, I was always an Apple man. Uh, When I actually, when IBM sold PCs, I had this crazy idea of actually using my client's product. And um, I switched to an Apple ThinkPad. I mean, an IBM ThinkPad. At the time, IBM was still making computers. They sold that division. And I loved the ThinkPad. The ThinkPad was fantastic. If, if you're using a PC in the world, even when I was doing it, say, 15 years ago, if you're using a PC in the world as a creative, it's a little bit like walking around black and white in a color world. You have to go Mac. 
Yeah, yeah, true. Good answer. Um, independent or network? Oh, independent. French fries or French toast? Ooh, that's a salt. That's a salt and sweet question because that, that's 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 mood contingent. Because sometimes I need salt, sometimes <laughs> I want sweet. Well, uh, that's a, that's a Rob Schwartz one, so he needs an answer. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'd go French toast. Just, just just in honor of the the holding company CEO. Good stuff. Yeah. Okay. Three more. Uh, Yankees or Mets? Oh God, that's hard. I'm going Mets. Uh, you know, I'm a Yankee hater. I'll tell you. I'll tell you the, the backstory there. The Yankees were owned for many years by uh, kind of a uh, an archetype of what's become Donald Trump, a bully, a bully who mm. in, in, inherited millions from his father and pretended he made it by himself. And he would boss people around, fire people willy nilly. A guy called George Steinbrenner. It was actually convicted and sent and and uh, I guess commuted by Richard Nixon. But I. Yankees are bullies, and I, I more than any other archetype, I hate bullies. And mm. it's kind of an American. I'm not saying it's not an English thing because I read Tom Brown's School Days, but it's you know this American like I did it all by myself uh, except for the 172 million dollars I inherited from my father. Bully, yeah. and that's what Steinbrenner was, and and that's what our current and uh, president is. And I, I hate that type. I can't root for the Yankees because of that. Yeah. I have fond Yankee memories because I grew up when the Yankees were, you know, pre all this. But um, no, I don't. I can't. I can't root for the Yankees. The Mets. The Mets are hapless, and I find them unlikable. But I'd prefer almost anyone to a bully. Like I'd prefer Mussolini to Hitler. Uh, so <laughs> that's my, that's my next quick fire. <laughs> Uh, well, okay. Well, there is a bully link here, I think. So you've got two left. Um, famous Chucks, Gary Vaynerchuk or Chuck Norris. Oh God, uh, that that's that's a very similar question. I I guess yeah. I, I don't really know anything about Chuck Norris except I think he's a far right supporter. So I'm going to go Vaynerchuk, even though I can't stand the guy. Okay, and last one's tricky. Ron Rosenfeld or Len Sirowitz? Oh my. Um, in my humble belief, and I work for them, uh, Len had more talent. Ron won more awards, but by the time I got to know them, Ron was tuned out. Uh, he was more of a general contractor in different homes in Sag Harbor. Uh, and Len, Len, you could, you could get excited about work still. Ron was no longer excited about work. So I preferred Len. He never showed me his ill temper. I, I heard from peers that he had a really bad temper and was very mean. He never showed it to me. I'll tell you, though, with Ron, can, may I be discursive? Please. So um, the agency, Rosenfeld, Sierowitz, uh, whatever it was, Humphrey and Strauss, occupied a floor of a building at 111 Fifth Avenue on Fifth Avenue and 18th Street. And the building itself was two or three cast iron buildings from the turn of last century that were amalgamated together. So the building, the footprint went from 18th Street to 19th Street from Fifth Avenue to Broadway. Broadway down there is diagonal, so it's not quite a square block because it's diagonal, so, so the floor is a little longer. But I sat on the Broadway and 19th side Ron and Len literally sat on a pedestal on the 18th and 5th Avenue side. So it was a full block from get to get to my office from their office. So when I had copy to show to Ron, Ron was a Hall of Fame copywriter. And I didn't have a great deal of respect for him pretty early on, but I still had to show him copy. I would call his secretary. We still had phones in those days, not cell phones. And I would say, uh, I forget what her name was, Donna, tell me when Ron's getting ready to go to lunch. Because I knew if he was hungry, he was a man of appetite. I knew if he was hungry, he wouldn't linger. And so she would call me when he was you know, getting his parcels together to go to lunch. And I would leave my office when I got the call. I would time it just so I got to the elevator when he got to the elevator. Because I could walk a block when in, in the time he could walk 40 feet. So we would meet at the elevator. It was all, you know, quote unquote, serendipitous. And I'd say, oh, Ron, I got to show you a copy. 
and he'd look at his watch. He'd be annoyed with me. I got to go. To, I, you know, I'm going out to lunch. I said, "I'll oh, just take a minute. It's just a short piece of copy." And that's how I would show him copy before the elevator came. And that's how I dealt with Ron, because if if, if I gave him half an hour, I would have been there all night. <laughs> but if I gave him thirty seconds, that's how I got through. That probably wasn't fair, but um, I did it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's good story. It makes sense. It makes sense as well. Now, now, George, um, we always like to ask how people's lives and careers start off, particularly because I always enjoy the scenic route that many <laughs> seem to take coming into the, the industry. So can you tell us how it all began for you? But please make sure you elaborate on your season in the Mexican Baseball League under a certain Hector Quesadilla. Well, heck, Hector. Oh, thank you. Um, well, you know, my story goes back to 19. I'm born in 1957. My story goes back to 1945 because my father's family, uh, his, he was one of three boys of immigrant mongrel Russian Jews, uh, you know, who got pogromed out of Russia. They arrived in Philadelphia with no money and no English. And quickly became the boys, not the parent. The father died. My grandmother lived on, but she never learned to speak English. The boys quickly became a kind of breed of first generation Jew, like a little fast talking, hardworking, always looking for an angle, making it. If you know the character, uh, Bud Schulberg wrote, wrote the book, uh, What Makes Sammy Run? about a, a guy who's a little too aggressive, works a little too hard, his shoes are maybe a little too polished, and he's, he's going to make it to the top no matter what. And my father's brother, Sidney, was one of those guys. He opened up an, an ad agency in Philadelphia called Waitman Advertising. It was called Waitman Advertising because they rented rooms in a building called the Waitman Building on Chestnut Street, and he wanted his clients to think he owned the building. So he, he named his agency after the building. And so he opened that around 1945. When my father left college, he, he did a little work for Waitman Advertising to get his, for his brother, and, and he learned the ropes. Now, these were the early days of television, because say it was 1949, 1950, probably 80,000 sets in the United States at the time. So television was like the digital, like digital was in 1996. You know, a lot of it was if you were doing something for um, a refrigerator company, you were selling refrigerators to housewives. And I know that's gendered, but that was the world back then. It was like, look how simply the door opens. See how the shelves pull out. It was really demonstrations and really, uh, you, you can understand that, though. It's very much like kind of, I guess today we call it content or long form. This is how it works. And... That's where my father cut his teeth. He then got to, um, he went across the river in an industrial city called Camden, which is probably one of the poorest cities in the United States now, but it was the headquarters of RCA uh, and, and worked in the advertising department there. RCA in the late 40s, early 50s was like Apple Computer is today or Tesla. And my father got experience there as a copywriter. And then in 1954, he and my mother moved to New York. They got married in 53, moved to New York, and he got a job at a, I would say, a bland but top 15 agency called Kenyon and Eckhart, which merged into Bozell, which merged into Amirati, which merged into SSCMB, which is now out of business. Uh, the holding companies did that, and mm. he, he did very well there. So he moved up from copywriter or junior copywriter to chairman of the board in probably 15 years at a time when you could be CEO and a creative and in your early forties. But the world I grew up in was, he was never home. And by the time he was early 40, he had had two heart attacks. Wow. So, uh, you know, which was kind of, so people would say to me, George, do you watch Mad Men? And I said, no, I think, it would be too painful for me to tell you the truth. So I've never watched an episode. Mm -hmm. So I spent my childhood saying, God, I don't ever want to do this. So I wanted to be an academic. I wanted to 
live in a little leafy college town and read and write and um, and do that. After baseball was over, I went to school in New York and I got my degree and I got a master's degree. But I quickly found out I really didn't have, um, and it's actually hindering me. It actually hindered me in the in the business. I really didn't in the advertising business. I really don't have patience for bullshit. And as you know, a lot of academia is is bullshit because we we've, we've solved all the big questions. What does the whale mean? Now yeah. you know in in Moby Dick. Um, now we have to get into like the esoteric stuff, like. Weather conditions in Shakespeare's Macbeth and their and their forecast of global warming or the Little Ice Age's influence on King Lear. You go, oh my god! <laughs> they got to zoom in so far, haven't they? <laughs> yeah. Well, be, well, because you know you have to do something original. Yeah. And you know you're for uh, Shakespeare, for example, you're four hundred years in, so you know you can't you can't talk about. Uh, order being upset, you know, people were writing that essay in the 1700s. So you have to find, you know, something about, you know, newts and the portrayal of witchcraft in medieval literature. Okay. Um, You know, I didn't have patience for it, to be honest with you, because most people don't get the basics. And I, I was more interested in kind of helping people get the basics. Anyway, Academia, I quickly found wasn't for me. 22, living in a really dangerous New York. And I, the last thing I want to do is go to my parents' home and live there and look for a job and go to law school, as they wanted me to do. So because talk about theoretical and esoteric, I really didn't want to do that. I got a job, uh, an ad, uh, so to speak, advertising job. I answered a, a help wanted ad. And uh, the New York Times at the time probably had a 30-page help wanted ad section. And each ad, uh, New York Times, a broadsheet for people in the UK who don't know. It's not a tabloid. So each ad was probably three-eighths of an inch by a column width, so uh, an inch and a half. And it was 30 pages of ads. And I, I looked at copywriters. I got an ad for a catalog company called Montgomery Ward, which was co- probably like uh, the poor man Sears. And I ran down to the garment district where their offices were. It's a big company. And I took a test, a copy test, and I passed it. And I think I went to work the next day. Okay, this is fine. This is something kind of I understood. And I took a class at School of Visual Arts. And I, you know, I moved from that catalog copy after a couple of years to the in-house advertising department of a store in New York called Bloomingdale's. And I worked there for a couple of years. And I refined my book. You know, at the time, uh, New York had dozens of agencies, not like today. Um, There were many, many more agencies. And, um, you know, pretty much every lunch hour, I would, it was still physical books at the time. And so you couldn't just email a book. And you'd you'd run down to, you know, 6th Avenue and 44th Street and drop your portfolio. And then you'd run to another place, Lexington and 45th, and drop your portfolio. And then, you know, that, that, would, that would be your launch hour. And I eventually got a job at an agency called Low Marshock. And, you know, and then from there, you just kind of keep, keep going and, <laughs> or keep getting uh, deeper, deeper down the rabbit hole. And, you, <laughs> you know, and then you're making too much money to get out and then children and whatever. But, you know, I, enjoy, I, I truly enjoy the business uh, or uh, enjoyed the business. I'm going to put that in past tense and never had a heart attack. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I tried to do a better job kind of balancing my work, and my life than my old man did. You know, I, I never really got along with he or my mother. And I, I used to say, you know, no one's totally useless. Uh, they can always serve as a bad example. And um, that's kind of how I saw his career. So I, I had his overarching ambition to do well, but I tried to kind of leave at night. Yeah, I think that's important. I don't think enough people do try and leave at night, sadly. It's, it's, a, it's a bizarre hustle porn badge of honor in many, many shops. 
Yeah, yeah, hustle porn brings us back to one of your flash questions with Gary Vaynerchuk, and maybe I'll change it to Chuck Norris. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, why choose? Why choose? I was going to talk to you more about um, Ron and Len. So, uh, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, you essentially learned copywriting from those two kind of Hall of Famers. Well, I, yes, and no. I, I went there because at the time, there were, I'd say, three stratas of agencies in New York. There were the giant agencies, the McCanns, the BBDOs, the Ogilvies. There were the small agencies around 150 people. And then there were the in-between, like, 300 people agencies. And at the time, the best agencies were in that middle tier. There were around 300, 300, 400 people which meant they were big enough to handle national accounts and have big budgets, but they weren't so big like the McCanns and the BBDOs that you'd have seven teams on an assignment and you, you might never see anyone above an ACD. At the time, ACD meant something. And, then you, and you never really wanted to go too small because you might just be working on like a carpet shop, a local carpet shop, and it, it wouldn't be if it was a, a magazine ad or a newspaper ad, it wouldn't be full page because they didn't have the money. You probably wouldn't be doing broadcast, blah, blah, blah. Ron and Len were slightly different because they were both Hall of Famers. I had come from a mid-sized shop, Marshawk, which was a good agency but didn't have a great reputation. I wasn't getting great assignments. I wanted more. I didn't like my ACD at the time. I didn't think she was very good. And I wanted more... I had an end game. I wanted to go to a place called Amirati or Scali. Those were the two best shops at the time in New York. And I thought that working for two Hall of Famers, I would hone my craft, that I would I would get to know my craft, not even hone it. Um, and then I found out Ron and Len were pretty much tuned out. Um, but, and here's the, the big but, um, I was six blocks away from... Uh, maybe the largest used bookstore in the world, certainly the largest one in New York, called The Strand. And on 18, on 12th and Broadway, uh, we were on um, 18th and Broadway. And I quickly found out you could buy used awards annuals for $10. So every lunch hour, I would, uh, you know, twice a week maybe, I would run down to The Strand and buy another awards annual that I didn't have. I didn't have a ton of money in those days. So to spend $25 on books was basically my dinner money. But that's what I did with my dinner money. And by the end of my 20 months at Rosenfeld, I had probably 100 awards annuals, probably going back from 1962. This is 1980, 1990 I left there. I probably had every art director's and one show. DNAD hadn't really made it to America yet. Um, but I probably had every art director's and one show annual between those years. I had literally dozens of them. Coming as I did, in a sense, from an academic background, I was academic in how I approached them. I, I, I don't take notes because I, I have a really good memory, but I would, I would identify people whose work I liked. And just like if I liked Faulkner, I would go deep and read everything that Faulkner wrote. And then I would find an interstitial off of Faulkner and go to Catherine Ann Porter or go to this one or go to that one and find out. And I would do the same thing with um, creative people. I would find people I liked. I would literally study their copy. Mm. And that's where I learned really much less from Ron and Lan and much more from these, these annuals. One evening, Len came to my office because he liked to hang out with me. And he gave me this book and he had done hundreds and hundreds of ads for an institute to help prevent childhood blindness. And he had done some amazing, amazing ads. And he gave me a bound book of literally a hundred of these ads. And they were wonderful. I don't know who the writers were because if you ask Len, he did everything. But... um, (laughs) Yeah, but it, it, it was, he had an ego, but but he wasn't nefarious about it. He wasn't ev- he wasn't evil about it. But you know, th- these were fantastic. They're still fantastic today. They just happen to be black and white, you know, and a, and a very simple kind of 
you know, photograph on the top, headline, and three columns to copy that kind of thing. But yeah. um, no one's improved on that, by the way. So, so it was more a education of osmosis than an education of pedantry, uh, if I can use big words. Yeah, it was. It was more like I was around these people. I was in a milieu. I and I studied. I knew. I knew who I wanted to emulate. I learned who I wanted to emulate, and I emulated them. Um, and I knew where I wanted to go. Yeah, you just said um, that nobody's in, improved on that, by the way, and, I, and I'm, I'm in agreement with you there. Do, would you say, in a nutshell, it's because we many have become too focused on the delivery mechanism and not what's being delivered? You know, my last campaign, I was at Ogilvy two times, and uh, my last campaign, the fir- when I left the first time was for some technology product at IBM. And you know, technology products are boring in many ways. And you know, basically, I wrote good headlines. We took a picture of the products. I wrote some copy. I put some specs in them because it was that kind of a product. And so I guess we were entering it for award shows, whatever. And the account person says to me, well, what are we calling this campaign? And I'm looking at her, and I don't have a big concept here. It was just write write headlines and and have a picture of the uh, say what the product does and have a picture of the product. So I said, I don't know, call it the big type campaign, because my thesis was really simple. I, we were in the newspaper at the time, at the time, the New York Times, the Journal. People still read newspapers, and I said maybe this is too stupid and too simple, but I want to have the biggest type in the newspaper. <laughs> I yeah. mean, if everyone else has. 16 point type i want to have 36 point type because which one's going to get seen yeah. i mean if you have two stop signs which one's going to get seen my job is to get seen I, and and you know i i love dave trot you know who breaks down communication into you know attention communication persuasion well in terms of attention and hierarchy what is better than that 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 paradigm I mentioned before, or having the biggest type in the in the magazine. It, it's the same thing car dealers do, you know, on local television. They mix their commercials louder. Yeah, and, and you and you know the whole attention or impact, uh, communication, persuasion. They're, they're almost they're, they're three consecutive hurdles. And if you if you don't vault that first one, then it, the other two are totally irrelevant anyway. Exactly. It's it's. I mean, even. You know they 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 ignore the Ogilvyisms now, but uh, at Ogilvy, but you know ninety five five times more people are going to read the headline than the body copy. Yeah, yeah, there you go. You, you know, if you don't get people to read your headline, why are we struggling over body copy? Exactly. Yeah. 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 Same point. Well put as well. Uh, just quickly on Ron and Len, <laughs> I've read that they both wanted you to marry their daughters. So assuming they both liked their daughters, that's quite a compliment. You know, there's a New York Jewish thing going on here too. Okay. You know, like I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm a New York Jew. I'm a hustler. I work hard. I'm a, I'm a good boy. No drugs. No tattoos. No, no yeah. anything. So it's like, yeah, okay. I'm not a doctor, but um, I'm also not. You know, <laughs> I'm not running to the racetrack. I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not doing uh, lots of naughty things. So yeah, I'm, a, I'm a, you know, I'm a. Okay. I'm the advertising equivalent of a CPA. You, yeah, you know, yeah. I, <laughs> you know, I'm as stable as it gets for being out of my mind. Yeah, that's that's uh, so. Rory Sutherland talks about satisfying, doesn't he? So he says consumers aren't maximizing. They're not trying to maximize their utility when they spend. They're just trying to reduce the risks. So they right. they shop, they satisfy. So maybe so you're the perfect satisfying yeah, uh, son-in-law. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there you go. You know, my, my wife, and we've been married 36 years, she's short. She's 5'1". I'm 6'2". And, you know, in my darker moments, I'll say, basically, we've been married for 36 years because I can get things off of top shelves. It's not, <laughs> it's not the worst thing to have. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's it. That's a, there you go. There, there's your features and benefits. George, yeah. six foot one <laughs> benefit, get stuff off shelves. Love yeah. It. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's, you, you know what, there's a lot to be said by stuff like that. There, there's a lot to be said, like, yes, yeah, you know, she can, she can, she can carry buckets of water in from the well. I'll marry her. 
I mean, that's the way the world would like to meet. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. A lot of trouble. Yeah. Yeah, well, she's getting the first cut. Um, yeah. so can we can we talk about? We don't have to go too deep on it either. But can we talk about ageism in industry? Because yeah. in the industry, because I I don't feel like it's. I mean, it is topical to talk about now, and it's relevant and appropriate, and all of those things wrongly. And and I don't think it's it's new. No, I just think maybe there's a, a few more lights shining on it at the moment. I, you know, I, I really think, and I've been saying this for a while, I mean, the thing that Mark Reed said last week, you know, whatever, 80% is under 30, and, and nobody has a, 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 nobody harks back to the 80s, luckily. I mean, that was just asinine. Mm. I'll tell you, I was more upset by something this guy wrote, this guy called Avi Don wrote in Forbes afterwards. And because really ageism in an advertising agency now is I don't want to pay ism. And the business as it's constructed is meant to enrich the owners of the business. It's not meant to help clients anymore. I know this is super cynical, but you know, if you look if you look at the C level of the holding companies, they're all making seven or eight figure salaries. You know, your friend Mar- Marty Marty Sorrell, you know, made hundreds of millions of dollars for many, many years, you can't take that much out of an industry and expect the industry to do well. So, right. I mean, the money just isn't there. So, I mean, it's a little bit, and and I can, I can, I run a little red, but it's a little bit the the same, the same thing the uh, East India company did to India. We're going to take all the wealth out and leave nothing back, nothing behind. So that's kind of what the holding companies have done. And people of my vintage were used to the industry where you could make good money. You could live in a nice house. You could have cars and retirements and things like that. And they don't want to do that. They don't want to pay those salaries anymore because they might impinge upon the $16 million that the sea level gets. So what the industry's become and the parallels to the um, what used to be the news industry are pretty great. The the venture or vulture capitalists, depending on how you look at it, have come in and said, well, there's a lot of revenue that flows through this place. I'm going to take 87% of the revenue, run the place on the 13% I leave behind, and then clients or readers in the news industry, clients in the ad industry say, well, I'm not getting any value, but I need an ad agency, so I'll just cut my fees. Mm. So, so the vulture capitalists say, okay, well, we're, we have to take more out of this to keep our profit margins high. And the service gets lower and lower. You've seen this. Yeah. The service gets lower and lower. The, 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 the skill level gets less and less. The value add gets less and less. And the business is driving itself into extinction. I don't know what value it provides. And so... Yeah, there's ageism because nobody wants to see, you know, old fat men around. Uh, we're, you know, we're the last group you're really allowed to make fun of publicly without uh, worry. But they really don't want to pay people who are making decent salaries, middle class, upper middle class salaries, let's say. I yeah. mean, they much rather pay something, someone, you know, a quarter or a third or a fourth uh, or a fifth of what I make. It's a lot easier to run a business that way yeah yeah yeah. and it's and, it, and the only the only direction is down isn't it i i know enough about the business you know l- l- let me put it to you this way you know you know martin sorrell and you were probably being english you would know this better than i for, for a number of years he made i believe 100 million dollars a year so the way my math says my math goes is wpp if they paid him 10 million dollars a year it's still a lot of money i think they could have they they could have employed nine hundred creative people making a hundred thousand dollars each, with the money they saved. Yeah. Now, which one would have left WPP in better shape? I mean, you can argue either way. That's fine with me. But I happen to think investing in the company, and as, assuming that a third of those nine hundred hundred thousand people would have done something positive for a client, I happen to think that that the business would be in better shape if you reinvested in the business the same way an automotive company and 
you know, w would have been better if they kept re, um, reinvesting in their plant and making more efficient cars or engines or R&D or this or that. But no, instead, you know, the upper the upper one percent, whatever it was, said, well, we're, we're taking money out. We're taking money out and uh, we all have country places. Yeah. There's a, there's a there's a great he's a CFO but he's I know he's experienced he's worn many hats in his his career I believe a guy called Alistair Thompson and he's one of the smartest finance guys I I know certainly that I've ever met and he made a point to me a few weeks ago talking about a a, a different but you know indirectly fairly similar point and he said the trouble is with the cost cutting approach is you can only cut what's already there but with creativity you can grow infinitely exactly and and creativity demands an investment you know and that's what you know i spent the first 20 years of in, in the business or 10 out of 40 let's say i didn't have to do timesheets my job was to understand everything i could about this client and and nobody said you have to work 24 hours a day but if I was working on a bank, part of my job, as, as I saw it, was to wake up in the morning and read the Wall Street Journal, because that's what my customers were reading. And that's what my clients were reading. And how can I talk to and, and so I couldn't put that on a timesheet, because how do you put that on a timesheet? Yeah. But you're supposed to live and breathe your clients. Now it's like, no, you have two hours to do this. Write, a, write an ad about oil burners. You have two hours. Well, I don't know anything about an oil burner. I live in an apartment. Well, here's a 68-page deck. Okay. That's the way the business works now. As opposed to when I was a kid, I would have gone out with plumbers. And I, you know, I would have talked to people in the winter when it's cold about what it feels like. You know, You would have done that. Yeah. There would have been some humanity and empathy, I think. I think that's gone now. We don't, that doesn't fit on a timesheet. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think um, even retrospectively in, in Mark Reed's case, but I suppose regardless, he had to come out and say it was quoted out of context because otherwise he would have been in the firing line even more. But they, I mean, they all typically claim they value experience and, you know, age and diversity. But the stat, you know, the stats are wrong. Now you've got the stats. I, I sent them, I said, like, I don't care if it's out of context or not. I can say to you, Giles, I hate left-handers. I would never hire someone who's left-handed. And, and then it, it makes the trade press. Tannenbaum hates left-handers. And I said, you know what? I'm sorry, guys. I was quoted out of context. Uh, you know, I, I actually love left-handers. And then if you show me a chart that says my company, out of 100 people I employ, only one is left-handed, I don't give a shit what the context is. I, yeah. I really don't give a shit. I mean, I wrote that poem. I don't know if you saw the poem I wrote. I did, yeah. You know, I mean, I, I didn't mean, I didn't say the things I said. I didn't mean the things I meant. I mean, <laughs> I don't care what you said. You, 2% of your people are over 60. You can't tell me you value them. We're 25% of the population, 45% of the, of the wealth. You'd never get away with that in any other quote unquote protected group. You you'd be hanging from a lamppost on Madison Avenue. Yeah, totally, totally. Uh just as an aside, over fifty percent of my little agency are left handed, which is fucking <laughs> weird. <laughs> it's weird. My wife's left handed. I'm I'm constantly reminding her that Hitler was too. Uh, <laughs> Hitler being left-handed seems like the natural place to end part one of our chat to George. We simply can cram it all into one normal length episode, but be sure to tune in again for part two in a few weeks where we discuss the current state of copywriting, what he'd be doing if he was Joe Biden, leaving Oglesmi, the power of sleep and creativity, and a quite brilliant cameo from his wife.
yeah.